let's get started. And I thought, you know, we can't talk about the Constitution without talking about the Declaration of Independence. So here is actually one of the originals, and that's such a hard word for me to use, of the Declaration of Independence. And as I get a little closer, and Tom gives us the frame of reference of what led us to the Constitution, I bet you can kind of figure out, I know it's hard to read, but that guy's name really big right there. <laughs> So yeah, yeah so, 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 so no, no better place to begin than the Declaration. So just think about the Declaration of Independence itself in so many ways lays out the foundational values of the American constitutional project. Those commitments to you know, natural rights, equality, liberty. One that we'll talk about a lot today, the idea of popular sovereignty, the idea that government, its legitimacy flows through the people, through we the people, and that when our form of government doesn't meet our needs, when it fails, we can replace it. We can replace it, not by a coup, you know, not by, you know, in the end, just a few people saying we need to replace the government, but by we, the people. And so what's so powerful, Curry, you know, we're obviously gonna get to the Constitutional Convention and it features so many famous figures in American history that we'll see in a moment, like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, but when they got to the convention to reform our form of government, what they, what they would say is that what we are putting down is a mere proposal. It's a mere proposal. Uh, Madison would say, you know, without the people breathing their voice into this, it's no more than just a sheet of paper on my desk. And so we'll, the constitution begins with popular sovereignty, we the people. It ends with popular sovereignty saying that the people themselves have to say yes or no through the ratification process. And that begins with the Declaration of Independence. So I'll just sort of, I wanted to use the declaration as that sort of frame. But what the declaration opens up is it's beginning a new American project. It's saying no to the British empire, yes to revolution, but that raises its own practical problems or practical challenges. One is you have to win the revolution. So there's that, that's George Washington's task largely. We have to do that. But we also then have to set up new structures of government, both at the national level and remember at the state level. So at the national level, what we have before the constitution is a national frame of government, the Articles of Confederation. And so with this, what we set up, the, what's the one thing to know about the Articles of Confederation? Is that them right there, Curry? Yep. <laughs> okay, excellent. And so what we need to know about the Articles of Confederation is it sets up a weak national government, weak, weak, weak national government. They call it a league of friendship. I think of it today, it's almost more like the United Nations than the United States of America. What its goal is, is you know, ha for, for the states to be able to come together sometimes for certain things, but to as much as possible, leave power in the states, leave the states independent. They want the action to be there. And so in the national government, what sort of powers does the, uh, the Articles of Confederation leave out for the national government? What sort of powers does the national government not have under the articles? It doesn't have the power to tax. It doesn't have the power to regulate economic relations between the states. It doesn't have the power to keep us safe. It can't raise an army. It can't require the states to send troops from their militia to help the national government. It can't require the states to even send money to fund the government. And so with the Articles of Confederation, we have a national government that has no money and very little power. We have the, the threats all throughout the country. We have the European powers who are looking at us, laughing at us. We have the British still on our frontier, threatening us, assuming that this is going to fail. This is going to fail. You know, the revolution may have succeeded, but this project is gonna fail. And then the background, backdrop of this practically too is economic turmoil, economic unrest, an American economy that's flailing and a national government that doesn't seem up to the test. That's one project. So we have to do that we establish a national government, but it's too weak. The other is that we have to set state constitutions up in all of the 13 states. And so for many of the key figures in the founding generation, this is where the action is. The states retain the, the bulk of their powers under the Articles of Confederation. They're very independent. And these are the governments closest to the people with the real power. We are so many of the key figures at the founding, they care most. And it's an exciting project. They are the law givers of their respective states of what they think of as their separate nations. And so they set up, they try to learn from the experience under the British Empire. They try to learn from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the experience of the past. These aren't people trying to create something completely new out of thin air. James Madison is taking up the task of studying every republic in the history of mankind. And so like all of these people 
had this amazing moment, both at the national level, but especially at the state level, to create something new. And what do they do with the state governments? The big thing to remember there is the structure they put in place there, a lot of power to the state legislatures, not much power to the executive, to the governors. And so the state legislatures have a ton of power and they're closely linked to the people. They're very democratic governments and the governors have very little power. And so as, and we'll get to, we'll get to sort of how this brings us up to the convention in a second, Curry, but the framing thing to keep in mind is that the, in, the, in the back, back of everyone's head who, care, who wants a stronger national government, who is eventually going to push for a national, uh, for, a, for, a, for, a new, for a constitutional convention and a new constitution, they're thinking of a weak Articles of Confederation, one that we can't amend because it requires unanimity. Every state has to agree to an amendment. So even as they learn that the articles don't work, they can't amend it because have you ever tried to do anything by unanimity, whether it's your family, your classmates, anything else, it's impossible basically. So they're stuck with this bad document that many of them think is flawed. And then they're looking at the states and saying, what we've learned there is we need to rebalance the power between the state legislatures and the executive branch. We don't want an all powerful executive, but we need something stronger that can so to create a, a, a stronger separation of powers and a stronger checks and balance, more, allow for more of a battle of the branches between Congress and the presidency. I'll pause there, Curry, before we get on the precipice of the convention. Yeah, and, and I think that's really important because it, when you talk about the compromises and the debates that happened at the convention, you have to understand where they were coming from to see what they were worried about losing and worrying about giving away too much of. So if they were used to being their own powerful country, then that's really difficult to, get, to balance that by giving it away. But I guess one question before we get to May, Philadelphia, 1787, how much turmoil, how much were we on the brink of losing it all? So we, we fight, we write the Declaration of Independence, we fight the Revolutionary War by the skin of our teeth and thank you, France, we win. We're living under the articles, it's not working well. How bad was it um, at that moment in time? Because so let's be honest, most of our students probably hurt, like it glazes over. You jump right from the, the war into the constitution and then you pretty much jump to Gettysburg. But like the reality of it is what kind of moment was our society in to make all these people come to Philadelphia to throw out that article of confederation and begin with the constitution and ideas that they had from the state? Yeah, it, 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 again, it's, you're right, Curry. There's this sense when, as we look back, it's an inevitable march. Well, of course, yeah. it's the declaration to the constitution to the rest of American history. And of course it works, but you're right. The two things to keep in mind is one, when we get to the convention itself is that getting a document in place and ratifying it was not a foregone conclusion. We gave it back to the people to say yes or no. And that was a really close question. But before the convention, we had a series of problems that were really, really, really hard to address. And we were on a, on a knife's edge. Was the American project going to work or not? European powers assumed it wasn't. They assumed we could pit each other against one another and the government would collapse and they could swoop in and influence our government and maybe you know, establish their own power over us. And so you know, if you're looking at the state governments and national government, they have a lot of debt and not a lot of money. If you're looking at ordinary Americans, farmers on the frontier, they have huge debts. They have, you know, they're paying huge taxes to their states and they have no money. We have a national government that can't address any of these problems. And we have state, a state governments trying to balance between the interests of, you know, frankly, the creditors who are the people loaning the money and debtors, the people who owe people money and trying to figure out how do we balance those interests while we, how can we really help people without destroying our economy? And the backdrop is our economy is in turmoil, in great distress. And so this frames, you know, a really important topic, which is Shays' rebellion. And I'll pause that, Curry. I don't know, or do you want me to just dig right into Shays? Yeah, I think I, the only thing I was going to say about Shays is like this is my favorite case study to look at and say like how bad was it? And when we think about Shays' rebellion, and Tom's going to tell us the full story, but this is these are our own people. These are our own people that fought for revolution, that believed in a new country, a new government, that we're picking up arms because they were watching our country fall apart internally and externally. We were on the brink of losing it all. And, and again, I never remember learning that until, you know, picking up books and realizing, oh, we were that close? We were that close to not making it? 
And so it's really kind of this moment, this case study, but it wasn't just this one incident. There was a list of issues going on that really energized it. But Shay's is a great example of how bad it was. So yeah, tell us the story about Shay. Yeah, it's, it's the most, it raises the most fundamental question of all, which is what do you do with the government if it's one, not helping certain people, but two, can't keep us safe? The, among the most fundamental things we need a government to do, promote our common welfare and keep us safe. And Shays puts that all in sharp relief. So who's Daniel Shays? He's a 39-year-old farmer from Western Massachusetts. He was a Revolutionary War soldier. He fought at Lexington. He fought at Bunker Hill. Many of his colleagues here in Shays Rebellion, they were soldiers too. These are people who believed in the American project, fought for it, helped us cast off the power of the British Empire. But now they're struggling. They're struggling as farmers in a new America with an economy that's distressed. Like I said, they have high taxes, high debt, no money. They're losing their farms. They're being thrown in debtor's prison. And what they say is that both the national government, but especially their state governments, their state government in, in Boston, in Massachusetts, they're not hearing their voice. They're not feeling a connection between we, the people, and the government who's governing them. So what does Shays and his fellow rebels do? What, what do they do? Well, they march. They march throughout Western Massachusetts. Their goal is to get to Boston. They seize courthouses to keep judges from taking away people's farms. They close debtors' prisons to keep people from getting thrown in there for their high debts. They try to seize additional arms from Springfield, Massachusetts in the state arsenal because they want to, to as, as, as forcefully as possible, come to Boston and say, you, the elite, you, the governors of our state, you're not hearing our voice. And so it's a, it's a pretty amazing, and you're right, it's, it ends up being two sides. Uh, everyone in this debate believes in the project of America, but they all also sense that there's something going awry. And so why does this matter for the Constitutional Convention? Well, remember that Articles of Confederation does not give the national government the power it needs to raise an army, to, to, to call upon the state saying, send us troops so we can check the rebels. And so again, one of the most fundamental functions of a government is to keep its people safe, to avoid the threat of mob violence. That's one of the fundamental things. And they're not able to do that. Who puts down Shays Rebellion? It's a Massachusetts militia. And so as, as we're now, so Shays Rebellion is in late 1786 is when it's arising. And so now we have, we, we already had plenty of figures saying the articles are flawed, we need to revise it, we may need a new charter of government, but that gains momentum. These are voices like, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, they're increasingly trying to convince George Washington, who already took this problem seriously, to take it even more seriously. For Washington, he knows all about the failures of the Articles of Confederation. He fought a revolution under them, a revolution where he had soldiers who weren't paid, where the national government didn't keep their promises to the, to the, to the American soldiers, and who as a result faced mutinies from his own soldiers over time. So Washington understood what was going on here and understood the complaints of Shays rebels. But on the flip side, there's this sense that this is one act of violence, this is one threat of violence that we're seeing, one possible threat of mob rule, but maybe it's the first of many. It could be first, the first of many for two big reasons. One, the Articles of Confederation can't keep us safe. We've proven through Shays rebellion that the national government is not adequate to that task. But two, if you take Shays complaints seriously, We've also proven that the Articles of Confederation, the Articles of Confederation aren't up to the task of promoting the common welfare of the people. And so if you're George Washington, which it's great, now we're back, we're in Cyrus Hall, George Washington meets this moment thinking, one, I am a figure that's beloved by my countrymen. I'm revered around the world. I won the American Revolution and I did the extraordinary thing of giving up military and political power. I ensured that the American project, this American Republic could possibly work because it wouldn't be a military dictatorship. It wouldn't be a rule by one, but a rule by we the people. And so Washington thinks this is work well done. I'm going back to Mount Vernon and I'm ready to take it easy. You know, I'll still, I'll still follow affairs. I'll still write letters to my friends, but my national service, I've done my service to my country. But in the face of Shays Rebellion and many of these other threats we talked about, it's James Madison, especially, that has Washington's ear and says, no, no, no. We need a new structure of government. We need to, at the very least, revise the articles, but we know we can't do that. So we really need a new national government that's stronger than the Articles of Confederation, but still one 
of limited powers. And for that project to work, General, we need you. You are the only person that can make this thing work, that can make it legitimate to the American people as a whole, because people know if George Washington's at the convention, it's something that you need to take seriously. And so Madison succeeds, and so we end up in Philadelphia. So welcome. Uh, this is perfect timing for me to crash and then come back in the room where it happened. <laughs> so uh, that was a perfect lead up. So I am in a room that is one, about one block away from Independence Hall, which was the Pennsylvania State House at the time. I'm at the National Constitution Center where we work. Um, and this, is, this room is basically a recreation of the moment of the signing of the United States Constitution. So September 17th, 1787. George Washington is at the helm, Madison is right beside him. And if I do a very slow roll so you don't get nauseous, you'll be able to see the 42 life-size to historic detail bronze statues of people like Hamilton, let me get my hands right, um, and other people that were there for the signing of the constitution, M many of them who signed, and then three of them who are in, if I time myself right, those three right back there, who refused to sign the dissenters. So as we go through today's story and really look at the compromises, we're gonna zone in a little bit closer to some of these people and kind of get to know not just the constitution, the compromises, but the people behind them and understand them in a more human and holistic way so we can understand the great that they did that gave us legacy and our history and our experience today, but also some of the flaws as well. Um, so what we love, Tom and I love about this room is you really get to get to get up close and personal with the real people. There's something about the 3D of this. Um, and this is Ben Franklin here. And when I go back to Washington, you'll notice Washington is very like bronze patina colored. That's because just like in life, in statue, nobody touches Washington. It's true, it really is. <laughs> They're like, it's hysterical. You get kids running in here 90 miles an hour, like a bunch of third graders. And then all of a sudden they go up to Washington and they're like, they stand up straight. And I'm like, this is hysterical. Um, but then you have people like Ben Franklin here, who is the oldest delegate at the convention at 81. And I don't know if you can really see, but he's really shiny. His hand and his forehead are really shiny. People sit on his lap and they get up close and personal to him. And so let's learn a little bit more about the convention, the people behind it, and the humanity behind them as well. And that means the good and the bad. So Tom, where would you like to start? We want to go to the compromises. Do you want to go to looking through kind of what the structural constitution sets up? Where would you like to go next? Let's quickly do the structural constitution and then zoom through that and get to the compromises. Great. Yeah, so I mean, what, what, what is the end product? Let's, let's, let's fast forward it to the end product of the constitution here. So we're all on the same page. So what they do is the, they, the framers set up our basic structure of government. This is articles, this is the preamble in articles one through seven of the constitution. The preamble is that famous language that says that a government, we the people, this commitment to the expression of popular sovereignty, that we're gonna be governed by us, not by an elite, not by an aristocracy, not by a king. And Curry right there is next to one of my great heroes, Pennsylvania's James Wilson who is the prophet of popular sovereignty at the Constitutional Convention. He advocates for it when we're talking about Congress, when we're talking about the presidency. And this is a commitment to making sure that the government is driven by the considered judgments of the American people, not some elite. And so uh, Wilson plays a key role in that. We'll, we'll, it's one of my favorite themes, so I can guarantee you I'll weave it into the rest of the discussion. The next three, so the first three articles of the Constitution, Articles 1, 2, and 3, set up our framework of government. Article 1 sets up Congress, which is responsible for making the laws. Article two sets up the executive branch, which is led by a single president responsible for enforcing the laws. And article three establishes the judicial branch with a Supreme Court at the, highest, uh, at the highest level there, which has the duty to interpret the laws. So article one, legislative, two, executive, three, judicial. The rest of the constitution lays out a, a series of other, you know, a, a, it ties up a lot of different loose ends. You know, article four addresses really the relationship between the states and their citizens, handles how to admit new states, which we have this massive Western territory. So we know that's gonna be a major part of the American story. And also how to govern those territories. This is also uh, the part that includes the infamous fugitive slave clause. And then article five lays out an amendment process. And remember the articles of confederation re uh, required all states to agree to an amendment. Article five sets up a process that's somewhat easier than that. And so the idea there is the founders don't have a monopoly on constitutional wisdom. And so they wanted us a way in which we could learn from experience and adapt the constitution. 
Article six establishes the supremacy of national law so that the constitution is, is superior. It's superior over other federal laws, state laws, et cetera. And so national law is going to be superior to state laws. So, so the states are still gonna have a ton of power, but when the federal government acts, when the national government acts in a way that's constitutional, it cancels out what's been done in the states. And then finally, the last article is Article 7, which sets out the process for ratifying the Constitution. So we begin the Constitution with the preamble, with popular sovereignty, and with Article 7, we end with popular sovereignty. That the document is only going to become our actual governing statute. We're only going to throw out the articles and have this new Constitution if we, the people, say yes. And that's going to require nine states. Nine states have to say yes for the Constitution to be ratified. So that's, uh, that's a brisk job. Yeah, I love it. Um, one question, just to get make sure we all know who shows up to the convention. Were there any states that didn't show up to the convention? Um, and and is this one of the reasons why? I mean, I know that they had so many issues with the articles and having unanimous. You have to have a unanimous vote to change anything in the article, so they went for nine. But who were the players in the room at the time? Was it every single state? And was it always these 42 different individuals that were at the room from May to September? And how hard was that for them to stay in a room in Philadelphia? I mean, for some of them very far away from their homes and their businesses for an entire summer, a long, long summer. And then, you know, I don't know if you guys know Philly summers. They're not the sweetest. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, so, so think to remember, this is May 1787 to September 1787. That's, you know, on the one hand, you would look at that and say, it's around 100 working days. It's extraordinary they could write a constitution in that time. Yeah. But the other Good thing point. is, you're right, Curry. It's hot. It's smelly. The, the shades are shut. They're meeting in secret. It's, and, and so it, it's a really uncomfortable place to work at the same time. Um, you know, who's that? So we've already seen the, it, the convention does include some really famous figures, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, the most notable. The thing to think about the convention delegates as a whole is they're actually though very young. So Franklin's the oldest in his 80s, but most of them are in their 30s and 40s. The average age is 42. And so this is a young group. This is like the next wave of American revolutionaries mm -hmm. trying to set up a new government after the revolution. And not every state is there. So Rhode Island does not send a delegation. They're concerned that the national government's going to have too much power and that furthermore, that they as a small state are going to be outvoted by large states, that the small states who have a lot of power under the Articles of Confederation, a lot of protections for their independence and power are going to lose out as we move to a more to a national government that is stronger. And so Rhode Island's not there. The other people, and we know this just from giving tours so many times, Curry, is that John Adams isn't there. He's in England. Thomas Jefferson number isn't there. Number one question. Yeah. Just so you all know, the number one question at the National Constitution Center is people walk into this room and they go, where's Jefferson? And we're like, he, we want to put him on the front lawn in a beret and say he's in France. <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> like really far away. So great question from Aaron. And I think Aaron asked this question on Monday as well. Was, where, what was the status of Vermont at this time? I know they're not in the room, but were they invited? Was a delegate invited? I, I wasn't sure if they were a state until the 1790s, um, but I know we asked this question, so I just wanted to throw it in as we're talking about yeah. who showed up and who didn't. I have to say, we, we should check to be sure. I'm pretty sure it's not a state yet, but it certainly is, I, it's, it's, organ, like there's, it's organized. Yeah. And we often refer to the Vermont Constitution in multiple ways, because like the Vermont Constitution was quite anti-slavery, for instance. So it's, exactly. it is, it, it's, it's in like this intermediate state, I think. Yeah, I think it's like 1777 Vermont like bans uh, enslavement. So we talk about it a lot, but it's not considered, it's not at convention. Um, so number of people in the room, that's something I found fascinating when I learned about the delegates. Is it all the same people? Do they stay for the entire time? They come and go, like how many is the max? Um, and I know like Hamilton for a while leaves. Um, everybody talks about Hamilton being here the whole time and I'm like, Actually, he's in the beginning. He's gone for like a month and a half. And then he comes back, sweeps in at the end. It's like, I'll be on the committee of style. <laughs> well, no, it's, it, it, it is kind of amazing because, you know, for instance, key figures, people who are really big voices at the convention, like Maryland's Luther Martin, he leaves. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like He doesn't like what's going on. The reason Hamilton leaves, his fellow delegates from New York, John Lansing and Robert Yates, don't like what's going on. They end up being leading, leading anti-federalists. And so the New York... Uh, delegation doesn't have enough people to actually vote in the convention anymore. So Hamilton, though this key figure to, in the push for national power, um, ends up playing, 
He ends up leaving for a period of time. He plays an episodic role. He plays a much bigger role before the convention and then ratification afterwards. And so I forget, what, what, what is the high watermark, Carrie? But it's, it's like a good number of people coming and going. I want to say 70, but I say that with a head of hesitation that it was like 71. <laughs> Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's like seventy. That's what I was going to say. Somewhere in the somewhere in like the low in the low, low 70s. 70. <laughs> okay, and, and, you know, and, the, and we'll probably end on them. But the other thing to note is that there are people who stay till the end and don't sign the Constitution. Those dissenters we said at the beginning: Elbridge Gerry, George Mason, Edmund Randolph. And we'll end with them because their objections are really important. But these are people who decide the deliberative process, the debate is important enough. We think the articles are flawed enough that we want to be a part of it. And they contribute so much to the richness of the debates and even to what ends up in the Constitution. But in the end, they decide they can't sign it. And so we have this process of, you know, deliberation, debate. But in the end, it really is a real choice. In, do you stay in the convention? Do you leave? Do you sign the Constitution or do you not? And the fascinating part is that it's not a legal document at the end of the convention. You know, September 17th, the people who choose to sign it, sign it. It goes to the print house. It takes two days. What you were looking at in that room over there was the Pennsylvania packet. It was one of the first papers that anybody read, the general public read the constitution and it was sold basically two blocks away from here on our front lawn area. So it's fascinating. I always, this is where I like to talk about Akhil Amar because he talks about it's not the Constitution in D.C., it's that document. That's when the people get to know, do you choose to take this, do you not? And it goes back to ratification. So, Tom, real quickly, because we, we do have to wrap up, can you could just walk us through some of the big compromises, the good and the bad, like looking at, you know, the Connecticut Compromise, looking at the slave trade and slavery in the Constitution, and then we'll end with the dissenters. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's begin with the great or Connecticut Compromise. Kerr, if you want to maybe pan over to Roger Sherman, if we can. So the Connecticut, I'm sorry to <laughs> ask you. I went the wrong way. way. I always think so, Roger so, Sherman so the, in PA. So the Connecticut or Great Compromise is all about how are we going to structure political power in Congress? And it goes down to the division between large states and small states, large states like Virginia, Pennsylvania. So key voices like James Wilson, James Madison say, Congress needs to be structured by population. If you're a bigger state, you should have more representatives in Congress. Not, this is what, what Madison writes in the famous Virginia plan, which frames the debates at the beginning of the Constitution. And this debate over congressional representation and political power in Congress really dominates so much of the convention. So you have them arguing in the Virginia plan for uh, power, for representation by population. The small states don't like this. The small states look back at the Articles of Confederation, say each state, no matter its size, gets one vote. If we're gonna have a new constitution, we need, to protect, we need to protect the small states. We need to protect their political power. And so William Patterson comes up with the New Jersey plan. He's from New Jersey. And he and his allies in the small states say, we are not going to be swamped by the large states. We're not giving all the power in Congress to Virginia and Pennsylvania. We need to retain the power of the states and we need equal state representation. So Virginia plan, population, New Jersey plan, state equality. Is that, that William Patterson right there? I have to say, I don't know if I, that I gets a point that. about the lineup. But he ends up being yeah, a Supreme Court justice. He's a, he's a significant figure. So There's that's the New Jersey. from New Jersey. I mean, like, oh, yeah. in from New Jersey. Like, it's a, it is a powerhouse. Even oh, yeah. small, and thank goodness, because then they could have that, like, we need to be represented properly. Yeah, and so what's the Connecticut Compromise? Well, it's brokered by Roger Sherman, who we saw at the beginning there. And so the, effectively what Sherman gets the delegates to do is split the difference. The US House of Representatives will be organized by population. So the larger the state, the more the representatives. So James Madison and Wilson and the Virginia plan went on that, went out on that. And in the Senate, it's gonna be represented by state equality. Each state gets two senators, no matter whether they're a big state like Virginia or a small state like Connecticut. And so Roger Sherman plays this key role of forging this compromise. It's not as though everyone came together and said, this is a great idea at a big kumbaya moment. It's a close vote. It's a single vote that decides this structure. And James Wilson, James Madison are devastated. They are devastated that the Senate's organized by state equality and not population, not by the principle of popular sovereignty. So that's the Connecticut compromise. You know, quickly a, a beat on, on the electoral college um, mm -hmm. is that the electoral college ends up being similarly a compromise between, this is gonna be a big theme, theme it, it, you know, sort of like the, the, the people who are committed to popular sovereignty like James Wilson and Governor Morris, who's right behind you, Curry, from Pennsylvania. And what they advocate as we're deciding how to elect a president, they say, Let's go with the national popular vote. So something that really links the presidency to popular sovereignty. Many, many delegates 
the, you know, the majority of, uh, they, they certainly outvote the popular vote people say, no, 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 let's elect the president by, Congress should elect the president. We have the best and the brightest in America in Congress. They're gonna know these, the people running for president best. They're gonna know their character because for the founding generation, they cared not just about policy, but about character. And so they thought congressional election was the way to go. The electoral college again, ends up being a compromise between these two sides where for someone like Wilson, he can go along with it because he thinks it's basically a, the, the closest he's gonna get to a national popular vote. Over time, the states will have the power to make sure that electors are decided by the popular vote within a given state. And Wilson predicts quite correctly that states would quickly move to that process, shifting elector selection from the state legislature to the voters in the states. And then for people who support the congressional election of president, they think that we're get, this is effectively the electoral college is going to be congressional election by another means. Because everyone, of course, loves and knows and will vote for Washington, but they predicted that people would not people would not have a sufficient national rep a reputation after that to be able to get a majority in the electoral college. And so if that's the case, if no one gets an electoral college ma majority, it then goes to the House of Representatives who selects the president. And so George Mason predicts that 19 times out of 20, the presidential election is going to go to the House of Representatives. He was wrong, but you know, we didn't know how the system was gonna work. We can't fault him too much for bad predictions. Um, so that's the Electoral College. I'll pause there, and then obviously we don't have a lot of time, but we want to spend at least a little bit of time on the, the tragic compromises over slavery. And I'll, I'll use South Carolina as your G up for that one. <laughs> we have Pinckney, Pinckney, and Rutledge. Yeah, so, the, so the, the two big compromises here are the, the compromise, the three-fifths compromise, and then the compromise over the international slave trade. The three-fifths compromise is simply a, it's that next question you have once you have the great compromise, which is the US House of Representatives is organized by population. Once that's the case, you have to ask the question, how do we count enslaved people? And so slaveholders like the South Carolinians here argue that enslaved people should count as five fifths. They should count as a full person. And what this does is boost the political power of the Southern slaveholders in the House of Representatives over time. Opponents of slavery counter and they say, no, 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 no. Enslaved people, you don't treat them as human beings. They should not be represented here in Congress. It should be zero fifths, zero fifths. So it's five fifths versus zero fifths. This ends up being a topic of debate multiple times. It's where you see some of the most forceful arguments by anti-slavery folks like Pennsylvania's Governor Morris talking about the moral outrage that is slavery. But in the end, they compromise. Roger Sherman, again, playing a key role there. And they say, we're gonna count enslaved people as three fifths of a person. That ends up being the, probably the most important of these compromises over slavery, because it boosts political power for the slaveholding states over time, gives them a boost in the US House of Representatives, getting additional three fifths of, accounting for three fifths of a person for each enslaved people, each enslaved person in the electoral college, because the electoral college votes are linked to the number of members of Congress, they get a boost. And finally, because the electoral college boost, you have more presidents that are sympathetic to slavery. So it's a major way in which we structure political power. On the international slave trade, this is the last big compromise over slavery. And here the question is, will Congress have power to ban the international slave trade? So even for Virginian slaveholders like James Madison, George Mason, they, they, they may be okay with structural protections for slavery generally, but they deplore the international slave trade. So there's a, a really large supermajority in the convention that say no more international slave trade, but the, the uh, delegates from South Carolina, from Georgia say, you will not have a constitution if you don't protect the international slave trade. If you don't protect the, our, our slaveholding interests from the powers of Congress. The compromise that gets forged there is that Congress will not have power to ban the international slave trade until 1808, but afterwards it will. And Congress does ban it as soon as it can in 1808. But those intervening years between the convention and 1808, 200,000 more enslaved people are taken from Africa and brought to the United States and enslaved. So there's real, real practical consequence. The last capper there before we get to this centrist curry is <laughs> we're thinking about what's the big thing to take away about slavery in the convention. It's that on the one hand, anti-slavery voices, you know, folks who oppose slavery were able to argue, um, you know, that they did not write uh, an explicit uh, protection for property and men in the constitution. There is an explicit protection for slavery. They also didn't write the word slavery or slave into the constitution, but they made it clear they were willing to make compromises with the slaveholding states, structural protections for slavery that would project into the future in order to get the constitution done and ultimately ratified. 
Got it. No, and I know we dive deep into that in our slavery in the Constitution week. So if you want to unpack that, we can send you a link to that longer video because it does, it is really intricate and really long term. So we need to look at that infrastructure put in there and the and the connected to the reconstruction. So there's two classes on it. So finally, we end with like the best question from earlier today, which is, wait, were there people that didn't sign it? And why did they not sign it? And we look at the three guys back here, which modern day, we lovingly call them the dissenters. Um, our country is kind of born on dissent. It doesn't matter if you've been here a day or forever. It's in our DNA. And these are the three dissenters of the Constitution. They refuse to sign. So Tom, tell us a little bit about them and why. Why did we have Mason here and then Edmund Randolph and Gary over here, or Jerry, either way you want to say it. Um, why did they dissent and not sign? It's a great question, Curry. And it is one of the most powerful stories to tell. Because again, the Constitution showed a commitment to reason, debate, but also people if they disagreed. It's not as though everyone just linked arms and got along. People disagreed and disagreed strongly. So all three of these people, all three of these delegates were heavily involved in key debates at the convention. Massachusetts, uh, Elbridge Gurry there, was one of the great critics of the push towards democracy and a strong national government. Edmund Randolph, who's in the middle, he's the one who presented the Virginia plan. He began the convention as a key ally of James Madison. He was one of the, he's from the most famous and powerful political family in Virginia, and he had real political heft. And then finally, the last person there, Curry, is George Mason. Who's Mason? Mason also from Virginia. He's a neighbor of George Washington. They're friends. He's someone who is deeply engaged in so many of the debates at the convention over congressional representation, over the amendment process, over the international slave trade. He's the author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which will be important in a second. But this is like the most important when people said the Bill of Rights at the convention, they were thinking of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and he's the primary author. So what did these three dissenters, why were they so, uh, uh, what were they so troubled by that they refused to sign the convention, af the Constitution, after participating in the entire convention? George Mason destroying his relationship with George Washington in the process. They wanted a Bill of Rights. They wanted a Bill of Rights. They thought the structure here is fine. We're still concerned about the powers of the national government. One protection, one way you could give quiet to the unrest of the people is just put a Bill of Rights in there. And you have George Mason, who's like, you have the Virginia Declaration of Rights guy here. Give me a couple hours, give me a, a day or two. I know we've been here, I know it's hot, I know it's smelly, I know everyone wants to go home, but just give me a little time and the Constitution will be so much better. And the delegates, I think just as a practical matter, are just like, no, you've been sitting here through these conversations, delegates. Do you think this is gonna go, do you think it's gonna be easy or do you think we're gonna end up going down another rabbit hole? We wanna to go home, we wanna go home. We've done a good job. We created a Constitution, another 100 working days. Let's take this on later. We have an amendment process that can do it. And but Mason, Randolph, Gary said no. And so that begins sort of the next chapter in American history. And we have a Bill of Rights week coming up. So we'll get into that in more detail. Um, a great book is Plain Honest Men by Rick Beeman, who was a Penn scholar, but also one of the um, architects of the National Constitution Center. Great book to read about this. Um, and one of the things he says is, you know, they were just done. They were tired and done yes. and wanted to move on. And I'm like, I love that because it's very honest. They had to get back to their people, their lives, their jobs, their homes. Um, so I think it's a great time to wrap up on that. And we will, I love this uh, conversation because it leaves so many. Um, but wait, next time, like it's a cliffhanger, cliffhanger on so many ways. How does it get ratified? What happens next? What are the Bill of Rights? So we have classes on all these pieces. Thank you guys so much. I have one wrap up question. So after I end the recording, hang out with me, Tom. Excellent. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year.